Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is September 19th, 2024. It is exactly four o'clock. Uh, this is the Finance Committee. Uh, this meeting will be video recorded and broadcast over local access channel eight and through the town website at www.eastam-ma.gov. And the first item on the agenda is the review and vote on the minutes of the prior meeting, which was August 15th. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of August 15th? I move approval. That's Roy. I'll second. I'm sorry, who the second? Oh, Fred. Fred. Is there any discussion? Um, I, I would like to make one small, uh, correct, not correction, but addition under Jerry Sarasal. Um, I'd like to show that he was on Zoom. Um, we have the fact that he did join at 415, but it doesn't say that he was on Zoom. So I'm just going to ask Mayor to amend it for that um, purpose. Uh, any other discussion? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as amended? A Tom? Motion to approve the minutes as amended. Tom, and do I have a second? I'll second it. I'll do it, Mayor. Uh, Paul? All in favor of the minutes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're all here, folks. Nine zero. Unbelievable. Nine zero. Thank you, everybody. Uh, on to the agenda, and we have a special guest with us today. <laughs> She's up on the Zoom, uh, Lori Barr, and she is the HR director. And so I'm going to turn it over to Lori. Thank you, and welcome, Lori. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry I can't be with you um, in person, but um, I did send ahead my presentation, so I hope you got it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to read from the slide because um, you're all well capable of doing that. But I did want to talk about some of the things on the slides. Um, so, you know, you're all familiar with the basic responsibilities of what I do. Uh, can we go to the next? Yeah, there we go. Um, a large part of my focus most years is the recruitment and staffing. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the compensation benefits, the employee relations, and the compliance with labor laws and contracts. Everything I do is all really connected. It's kind of a big life cycle, right? Um, recruitment, I do have some stats for you that I didn't put in the presentation, but I thought you might be interested in. In FY24, I had a slow year um, in that I posted eight unique permanent positions for the town. Eight? Um, did, I'm sorry, eight? Mm -hmm. Yes, eight. Unique. We did post the firefighter medic position a couple times. Um, we did post some seasonal positions in addition to that, and we did have one grant-funded temporary part-time position at the Council on Aging. Most of the vacancies do come from turnover and retirements. And we are lucky enough, one of our successes that we fill most of our positions within one to two months, um, which I'm really proud of because a lot of towns take one to two months to even get a position posted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we post them for a minimum of two weeks. We accept applications on a rolling basis. Depending on the position, we have a process. We do one or two rounds. That may be a panel. It may be one on one with the director. Depends on the position and the level of the responsibility of the position. The higher the position, the more people we try to put in the person in front of because um, they would work with more people. Uh, once an offer is made, we do have a little bit of a hold holding pattern we're forced into because of background screenings and pre-employment checks. And of course, they give a professional notice, which we would want them to do to us, so we encourage. And then we can start a person. So it's about two months before we can get a position filled, um, which is a challenge in itself because then there's not a lot of overlap, if ever there's overlap, um, for training. In FY25 to date, and we're, we're not even halfway through yet, I've already posted seven positions. But we have had um, a big retirement next door at fire department, a promotion there. So we just recruited a deputy chief. Um, I'm happy to tell you that he will be starting on September 30th. 
Also in FY25, thanks to the town meeting vote, we've added new patrol positions. So there was some extra recruitment there. Um, we are expecting a disability retirement at fire in addition to the chief's retirement. So we are back out for firefighter medics. Um, we'll, we'll consider a well-qualified EMT, but preferences for a medic. We have another grant position coming through the Council on Aging. Um, you'll notice there's some DPW positions posted right now, and that's because we're doing some restructuring there. We had a retirement, so we took the opportunity to um, move some people around. And we have a shellfish constable vacancy right now. Um, one of our big successes in the human resources department is our IOD success. If you don't know what IOD is, it's injured on duty. That can be fire or police. Um, obviously it's exactly like it sounds something happened while they were employed for us and they were injured and a lot of other towns are experiencing very long term carrying the employee the medical cost we are having great success in working with the employee and our insurance company and either rehabbing people and getting them back to work or unfortunately moving on to retirement um and so that's another win for us because those vacancies can really hurt staffing levels over there. We can go to the next slide. And so one of my big responsibilities is maintaining the position control management. Uh, if we add a position, it has to go in here. We do a job description. I call it grading it because we have some, we have a, like a, rubric that will tell you the different levels of responsibility, the amount of points it gets, and that determines what grade and step it becomes. Um, that feeds into the next schedule, which is creating the salary schedules um, on the next screen. And the salary schedules are largely dictated by the collective bargaining agreements and the personnel codes. Um, every year I do the salary projections for the budget process uh, in conjunction with Rich and the department heads, making sure that we've got the proper amount budgeted for each person, each division, and each department. And that schedule is dictated, like I said, by the collective bargainings, which we negotiate every three years. Um, as a matter of fact, we are one year away from starting negotiations again. We typically try to start negotiations at least six months before the contracts are due to give us time to um, prepare, come to an and bring it to town meeting. Uh, I'm two slides ahead now, sorry. <laughs> and then wage inflation is one of our biggest challenges. Um, some towns pay more, some towns pay less. We try to find a balance between competitive wages and sticking within budgetary constrictions that we have. And then our last challenge on my last slide is hiring challenges. Um, recruitment is down. When I post a position, Five years ago, I was seeing somewhere in the vicinity of 40 applications for something like an administrative assistant. These days, we're lucky to get 10. Um, we have been very fortunate in East Ham that we get 10 quality applications. And so in that pile of 10, typically there is a candidate that does stand out, meets our needs, and will come work for us. Um, we are an attractive workplace because of our excellent workplace culture and some of the things that we have done to provide flexibility to employees and support to employees as long as an as as well as an excellent benefits package. Um, so that's kind of the highlights of what I do, my challenges and my successes.
Um, but I'm happy to answer questions. I thought that might be easier if I answered your questions. Hi, Jerry. Hello. Fred. Um, what's the hardest position you have to uh, try to fill in the town government? Um, they're all a challenge in their own way. The higher level positions like a deputy chief that we just did, um, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily the hardest in finding the right person. They are the most time consuming in terms of a process that we do because we do a really good process. Don't you think so far it's been fire and anything high level finance? Finance those are a challenge uh, that that's statewide the finance one um it's very hard finding people that know municipal finance and want to go into municipal finance um fire and actually i was thinking of dpw too and police those are very specialized positions um a they take a special person to want to be a firefighter or a police officer um And they indicate to us that it's, you know, one, maybe two contracts that they have in them before they retire. We can be looking at who their deputy chief is, if that person is the right person to move into the position. Um, same thing over at police, if that was the case, although the chief there tells me that he's got eight years, seven months, three days, and five hours. So, um, so I think we have a little time before we have to worry about succession planning there. but. They have the structure built in where they have sergeants, lieutenants, officers, so they have a chain of command that kind of moves up with it. Same thing at fire. Um, the harder positions will be uh, the town manager when that day comes. Um, we've already started thinking about what the succession plan is for that. Jackie talks about it. Um, if Rich was to leave us a finance director, that would be something that we need to be keeping at IR. Um, for secession planning. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Roy? Uh, the question on, I guess it's your fifth page, negotiating with yeah. you and Steve, Steve, excuse me, Roy. I'm going to ask Steve to put you, the uh, thing a little closer to you so you can. Thank you, Steve. Okay, my, my question concerns negotiating with unions. Sure. Uh, when you talk about reaching agreements on wages, benefits, working conditions, mm -hmm. how do you assess benefits? Is the benefits package at every municipality, is it pretty similar or are there major differences? Mm, that's a good question. That is a great question and they are pretty similar and we do our homework going into negotiations as well as the unions are really good about the, doing their homework. Um, so they come to the table with comps, we come to the table with comps and we try to strike agreement within what we can afford. Everything, you know, benefits are a cost. When we talk about what a collective bargaining agreement costs you percentage wise, if it's a 16% increase, everything we negotiate with them contributes to that cost. It's not just the salary that's going up 16% over three years. It's the benefits, time off, all of that has a monetary value. So do you see us as competitive, competitive in the benefits area? With other towns, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I do. We, 
We purchase, uh, one of the things that I'm not sure, I think you may know this, we purchase our insurance with the other towns through the Cape Cod Municipal Health Group. We're self-insured. And so the cost of the insurance is the same. It's just what different towns do for a split. Um, Nauset Schools does a little better. They have a 70-30 instead of a 65-35 split. Um, some towns do worse at a 50-50 split. So I would say we're pretty competitive. Okay, my next question is on wage inflation. Um, mm -hmm. One of your bullets there is increases in wages may not align with an organization's budgetary constraints. Mm -hmm. So if there is not an alignment, then what? That's when Rich comes to you for an override. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what happens. And it's happened. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'm, go ahead. Sorry, I'm Jackie. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Jackie. I think that's where it's, um, it's, it's getting more and more difficult because we used to be really competitive and now everyone's getting competitive. The, the environment that we're searching for is so competitive that if you want the A, the A candidate, then you have to have the ability to nego negotiate, and they're not just looking for an extra week of vacation. Right. You know, so it's. I think it's going to be a constant stressor for us going going forward. Unless, of course, you know, more people. We have more people and more trained people. And my last question is on your page seven hiring challenges. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about enhancing workplace culture and flexibility, flexibility are, is one of the uh, factors there, um, working from home? That is one of the benefits and the flexibility that we do provide here at the town. And that is huge. Um, you know, the mentality was that you weren't servicing the customers unless you were in the chair, and we found that that's not true um, and we can still provide good service to the citizens even with a little bit of a remote structure we try to keep um, a balance on that so right now policy allows most employees to work two days a week from home obviously there's some positions that cannot be done from home at all um, and there's some that could be done more from home um, but we try to limit it to two days a week that allows office coverage for the people that you know there's still some people that want to come in and have that face-to-face -face contact and they should be able to have that so we maintain office coverage while balancing the flexibility for our employees that's that's a bigger benefit than you realize um, it's a great retention tool for us especially when you are trying to find people that are trained especially like in the areas of we'll use finance because that's a really hard one um, people are not coming to work in municipal government for, in finance positions right now. And so you may have someone in Sandwich that's very, very good, um, but looking to come, you know, maybe they're an assistant town accountant there and we have an accountant's position open, which we don't, but I'm just going to give a hypothetical. And they can't come five days a week because of child care issues or whatever. We can offer that flexibility of some in person, some remote, and maybe even some schedule changes where they work, you know, a shorter day in the office and a couple more hours at home in the evening. It's a huge retention tool. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Steve, you had a question? Yeah, a couple questions. Um, what percentage of your employees are under contract uh, versus employment at will? Um, the so by so employment at will would be your seasonal employees. Everyone else falls either under a collective bargaining agreement or they may be a non-union employee, but they are represented by the town's personnel code that gets approved every year. Okay, and because so many are under contract or under union, what's the review process for the employee? Feedback to them performance evaluations how do you handle that 
That's a good question. Um, that is an area that we are working to improve on. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we do not have a merit system. So their raises are not tied to their reviews. For the most part, there are a few open merit positions. I'll use myself as, a, as an example. I'm an open merit position um, under the personnel code. So my review is tied to my increase. Um, but for the most part, your average workers that you see in the town are on a step system. We are working to improve the performance evaluations though, because that is important that people are clear what the expectations are of them and whether or not they are meeting them. If they are meeting them, that's fantastic. You want to continue to support them. If they're not meeting them, it's not really a penalizing tool. We want to know how we can provide assistance to them at that point. Is there areas that we need to provide more training in? Um, is there something going on with an employee that they need um, some flexibility and support? Or is it someone that we need to watch and see if they really are the best fit? We do a better job of the performance reviews with onboarding employees, yes. employees that are new to the town. We have a check-in system. I try to meet with new employees at least two to three times during their six month, first six months to year. They're supposed to be meeting with their department heads and getting feedback on a regular basis. And before they become a regular employee, their probation ends, we do do a formal review with them. Thank you, Laurie. You're welcome. Tom, you had a question. Yeah, Laurie, thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for your presentation. I got a couple of questions for you. The first one is uh, with respect to the hiring success that you've had, and you talked about hiring one police officer, I believe you said. Do you feel that we're on a good path to be able to hire that, at least the second police officer, and maybe have a candidate for further if possible? Yeah. So we have, um, from the, the funding that was provided at town meeting, mm -hmm. we have one officer that is at the academy right now. We have made an offer and we have someone that is entering the background check process at this time and pre-employment physicals and screenings. We have a second candidate, uh, a third candidate, sorry, that um, we are determining if they're, um, they're kind of entering the background process too. Mm -hmm. And then we do need one more person Okay, that's great. That's good. Good to hear. And I'm glad yeah. to see you're getting the, the pool that you want too. In in yep. a little bit broader sense, with all the interviews that you do and the candidates that you decide you want, are you able to close on your first choice, or do you at times have to back up? How many times do you get your first choice? I guess is my question. I would say I probably get my first choice nine out of ten times. Yeah, good. that's great. Um, in this last round um, with patrol we did not get our first choice a couple times unfortunately okay um, someone withdrew for personal reasons yeah there's Things a lot of reasons during the background process. Right. Right. nine out of ten but is a good most story of the time and I'm and I'm proud to say that it is not the wage yeah that is the deciding factor for people not being our first choice is there a driving reason across the board no, no it really varies the couple times that it's happened okay good and my last question we talked a little bit about flexibility and how important that is for the employees especially attracting and retaining as you said right um how do we as a town know that we're being successful with flexibility you know it's kind of come in since covid you know what i mean yeah. that really drove it drove it in a lot of places a lot of industries that i know felt they couldn't possibly have people work from home. But I, I know from the employee standpoint, flexibility is great and it's very successful. But from the business standpoint, from the town government standpoint, how do we measure that we're still being successful with the added flexibility we've added in the work schedules? Sure. Um, we really rely on our department heads to monitor that, you know, most positions have a deliverable, mm -hmm. a daily deliverable, a weekly deliverable, monthly deliverable. Um, if the deliverable is not being met, that's a strong indication that we need to re-look at that work from home plan. And we, we have done that. Mm -hmm. 
um, but most of our employees are incredibly successful working from home. We have very dedicated employees, very loyal employees. And so that has not really been a problem for us that we're not getting the deliverable. Great. So from the employee's perspective and I guess your, your customer, the town's perspective, it's working. Yeah, you know, our, our townspeople are, are really supportive and they're also very vocal. So, you know, they stop in and I've heard wonderful things from our townspeople about the staff, um, how friendly we are and how accommodating and it's something that we really pride ourselves on and I'm. That, that's great, thank you very much. My pleasure. Just Roy. To follow up on one of Tom's questions. Um, how do you do background checks? That again varies for positions. At the police department, um, they run a very in-depth background check. I do not get involved in that. Um, they are very well qualified to do that, so I just stay in my lane. <laughs> but um, for a firefighter, it's simply, and most other positions, it's simply calling their references, maybe some previous employers, um, we have a set of questions that we use to get the feedback, and most of the time, it's that all comes out fine. Some of the physical positions, depending on the union they're in, there is also a pre-employment physical um, that they are required to pass. And the criminal records check. Mm -hmm. We run a Corey, sorry, for everyone. Yep, we run a Corey and Sorry for everyone and an RMV authorization um, driving record check for anyone that is going to be driving a town vehicle in any capacity. But, uh, I'm sorry, so you, the town does those background checks themselves then? We don't hire Corey's outside firms? No, yep. no, I'm authorized to run Corey's and yep. Sorry's. I'm sorry, I didn't mean just the Corey's, even the background checks, checking the references, uh, criminal background, yep. that kind of stuff, we, we do all that ourselves. All in-house, yes. I have some questions. Does anybody else have some questions before I ask mine? Uh, Lori, about a, uh, how many unions do we have in town here? How many different unions? Five. Five? Does that, is that cause a problem dealing with salaries with five different unions? <laughs> um, I'm going to say no. I, I haven't seen a problem. We... Like I said, we do a really good job of doing our homework. And what I mean by that is we go out to other towns, check what they're paying, certain whatever union we're negotiating with at the time, what position what they're paying those positions. We keep an eye on what other towns are giving for COLAs, cost of living increases. Um, and we try to main compet remain competitive with that. Um, this year we did a really good job. We had noticed there were had become a discrepancy between the East Ham Employees Association and the personnel code employees, the non-union personnel code employees. And that really shouldn't be because a lot of the people that are represented by those two different bargaining units um, do the same thing. So we, we worked really hard to reduce that. And actually, they're, they both have the same salary scale now. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, no one's rewarded for being in a union or not in the union. Who, who's involved with the, you know, the union, the contracts yeah, from town here? So, yep, so Jackie, Rich and I sit together on the administration side of the table. Mm -hmm. um, typically if there's a, if we're negotiating with police or fire, the chief would also sit in on our side. And then on the other side of the table is um, the union's e-board, typically, or, or, or neg negotiating board. It varies from the unions. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just wanted to say one thing that makes East Ham a little unique, and I think Sheila enacted this and we just kept going with it, but it works for us, is we do all five contracts together, mm. always, mm. in the same year. Mm -hmm. And it's brutal because we're all involved in it, so it's like so much of a time consuming thing. But I have colleagues in other towns that are always negotiating mm -hmm. with the union, and that would just drive every, me. Every year it's crazy. another union. Yes. 
This way we can get all five done and we're in the same competitive market with all five. Mm -hmm. Like we're not, you know, one of them's not coming back and saying, well, last year you gave 5% in, <laughs> in a different year that could be totally different. So it really has, I found that to be exhausting but extremely beneficial. You get it over with in yes. a year. Every three years. One shot. Yeah. 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 Um, how, how much of an issue is what I'll call cannibalization? I, every once in a while, you'll see in the newspaper how we've hired somebody from another town. Another town has how, how hired somebody from another town. Um, yeah. I'm sure part of it depends upon what uh, jobs are available, what the pay scale is, et cetera. How do we uh, compare with pay scale to other similar towns on the Cape here that we have to, uh, that we have to deal with? Our wages are competitive. Um, we have good relationships with our unions, which help mm -hmm. in negotiating salaries. So maybe, maybe we give somebody an extra step because they've got experience, you know, especially if they're coming to us with experience, we want to hire them at a higher step. Our unions don't tie our hands to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's very helpful to us. So we're pretty, we're pretty competitive and we, we keep an eye on it constantly to make sure that we are. And we're always competing for that A person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if if I know an A person is unhappy somewhere, you know, and we happen to have that opening, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we're going to go for it because my only responsibility is to the town of East Dam, right? So, and I think that's where it happens. Uh, our employees, if they're not happy with their job or whatever, then then you're susceptible to it. And so it's going... You know, it's a very competitive environment for the best employees. I will tell you one of my favorite expressions is that we're all fishing in the same puddle. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even a pond anymore. But the remote work definitely has enlarged our puddle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that definitely does. Um, you talked about benefits, and I am uh, interested in that. Um, and I guess I'm going back to the family support package, which was passed by, I think, 2019 for pre-K and now for child care. And originally that was for uh, residents of East Ham. And I spoke to you uh, I, probably a couple years ago about uh, putting that into place for our employees as well. Uh, is that fully in place, both pre-K and child care for the children of our employees in town? It is, and we have um, had employees utilizing it. Um, I believe we have a couple currently utilizing it. I know we've had several over the last few years. It, it, that is a huge, that is a good benefit, Mary. That's, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Now. Have you found that that to be a, a good benefit? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you, yeah. 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 Child care is so expensive. They're so grateful for any assistance with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I guess my last question is, um, how do you, what's your biggest issue dealing with hiring people and and how does housing fit into that equation hmm. that's a good question um, housing is always a challenge um, and that's where the remote work helps us again because if somebody can live uh, you know further down Cape and doesn't have to come in five days they're probably going to be a little you know that commute's not going to kill them so They'll come work in East Ham because we have that benefit. Um, but housing is definitely a challenge, especially, you know, as competitive as we are, a step one firefighter or a step one patrol officer makes $65,000 a year. Yeah, it's not enough to buy a house. That's really hard to live off of. Um, and rentals are scooped up as soon as they come on the market. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a real, that is a real challenge. Um, we have, you know, again, this is something that East Ham does well. They, they know these challenges and they have their eye on them. You've got Rachel Butler in, in the housing coordinator position, um, Jackie and the select board, and, and you folks have all supported some purchases that we've made that probably will help us to increase our housing right here in East Ham. Um, if you can get your firefighters and police to live in East Ham, that increases your response time and your support. Right. So that's a, uh, it benefits all of us, plus, right? It's a big plus. It's a big plus. But it is a challenge. 
Um, and that's probably that's probably one of the hardest parts of recruitment. You know, if you can't can't afford to live here, mm -hmm. you can't come work here in those positions, especially you know, public safety positions especially. Um, we can't let you work from home to save someone's life. Mm -hmm. Do we have requirements that some people have to live within so many miles of, of the job? The patrol and, and fire have um, requirements for callbacks, but not for having a position here. Mm. Which that, that does help us. Mm -hmm. That does help us. Are there any other questions from members of the committee so you have the flexibility how many steps are there in a, in, a, in a position category for most of the unions we have a 10 step system um, typically you want that range to be about a 30 percent increase so a three percent step and typically at this you know in recent history colas have been coming in between two and around 2%. So you're looking at about a 5% increase each year till you hit that top step and then you still get the COLA. Thank you. You're and welcome. Actually, I have another question. Um, sure. I know we're looking at regionalization on, from the dispatch perspective. Uh, how do you get involved with uh, that type of thing from a regional perspective? And do you have any other ideas that where we could be more regionalized to save some monies? So I have several ideas of where we could regionalize. The challenge is finding the right partners. Mm -hmm. um, as far as regionalizing for the dispatch, what, it, depending on which way they go, I may not get involved at all. Mm -hmm. um, because if there's already a bargaining unit in place and they move to that bargaining unit, it won't be my purview. So it's really situational. Mm -hmm. And what are, what are your other ideas? Uh, so my position, human resources is a great one to share through towns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you could have a coordinator in each town, a director over like two or three towns and save some money that way, but still provide really good service. Mm -hmm. That's one. Um, finance director is probably another one. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Rich has done a great job of assisting other communities. Um, but that's a model that we could, you know, eventually use. Mm -hmm. We've tried. We've put our shoulder into it, Mary. We, we definitely, we've, it's not for lack of imagination on Jackie or Rich's part, thinking outside of the box on their part. It's, fi it's been finding the right partners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I have any other questions or comments from the committee members? Um, can I just say um, thank you to you, Lori. Um, I professionally did the job that you're in. And okay. you make it seem like it's easy. And folks, I just want to say on the record, recorded, what she does is not easy. Um, she has to be a sales per person, um, the pastoral presence, um, the hard edge, the tough person. Um, so congratulations. We're lucky to have you. If I, I really could, appreciate that. But I, I feel like I'm lucky. In. Yeah, if I could chime in, I think she, we are extremely lucky. And this is a position that I only dreamed of. You know, like when we started it, I thought, well, maybe, I don't know if the town will go for it because we are a small town. But what I've seen, the improvement in especially Okay, so I think we did an okay job of hiring people, I like to think that. But her onboarding, the, prevent the preventative aspect, Lori knows everybody. She goes, and this one goes to all the police academy graduations, the fire academy graduations. If someone gets an award, she hops in her car and drives to Worcester. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not talking about a minor commitment, um, but her attention to departments helps get to problems before they become real problems. And even though I'm meeting with department heads and Rich is meeting with department heads, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on below the surface that 
people trust Lori now and, and she gets to it. So thank you very much. No, I, I truly appreciate the opportunity. I am not lying when I say that we have some of the best employees in any town here. Um, your police is dedicated to the town. Your fire is dedicated to the town. It's really refreshing to work with people that bring professionalism to the table and are proud of what they do and give 110% every single day. It makes my job easier. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you very much, Lori, uh, for coming, for answering our questions, for giving us the information. We've never had you come to one of our finance committee meetings before, so I, I think that's something that we should do every year because I think we should know exactly what's going on in all the departments in, in uh, town hall here. So thank you very it's much and thank you for your work. Yeah, if thank you want- Thank you, I'll be happy to come back with an update. Good, okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Have a great night. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Lori. Really <laughs> that's Lori sick. Okay, that's the sick Lori. Imagine if she was feeling good. <laughs> okay, folks, um, we're on to the agenda, and we are on to the um, financial policies update. And. Uh, Mira had passed out some documents associated with it. Uh, how do you, I know Rich isn't here. I didn't know how you wanted to proceed. Or I don't know, unless you have ideas, like I have his Yeah, I have some list. questions. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can answer your questions. Well, I, th I think you can. Okay. Shoot, we'll try and then, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think one of the things that I wanted to know about uh, is the community fund, and I know that oh, it's yeah. been passed by legislation, and uh, it's in place now. And I know the part-time residents have given two thousand a check for two thousand right. towards the uh, fund. Um, the select board is now in the process, I think, of organizing how they're going to manage it and and maintain it. Or maybe you could just tell us how, what the next steps are for right. it. So I think. Um, Right now, the plan is that Jamie and Bob Bruns, so Jamie, Demetri, and Bob Bruns are meeting with Rich, and there, the three of them are going to draft some draft policies, regulations, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. to about you know who who will be eligible for this fund. What is the primary purpose that mm -hmm. we're going to use it for? How do we get money into it? All of those things, mm -hmm. and bring it back to the select board to you know, approve. review and approve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where, that's currently where we are. I know he's had one meeting with them already. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, the, um, there's also the discussion that we've had in the past regarding special ed costs and the possibility of putting something together, something similar to a stabilization fund. Right. Uh, we all know that we had an override this year of a, a million twenty. Uh, some of that was due to special ed costs. Um, I was wondering whether that is a, something that been been discussed at the select board level, or what your thoughts are on on it, that. It hasn't yet. I think probably. Um, so as you see, we just got estimated free cash amount so right, right. I think what Rich is going to be doing is as we move forward with the capital budget we see how much free cash we need for that and as we move forward with the operating budget and other things he'll be setting aside some money and we'll have to go to town meeting to establish mm -hmm. that fund mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure he'll have an update for you as we go along because we haven't decided because yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think you're aware that uh, I've asked Matthew Kravitz and Brooke Clenchy are both coming at our to our meeting next uh, next month, October 17th. Oh, okay. I didn't know. That. Uh, and Matthew is going to be giving us the uh, presentation on the special ed um, process. Uh, he I attended a similar uh, presentation that he gave to the East Ham Elementary School a number of months ago, and I thought that it was helpful given the override hmm. for him to come and give the presentation to us. So he's coming uh, next next uh, next month, and Brooke has 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 asked to join him, so the two of them will be here oh. for that. Yeah. 
Um, does anybody have anything else that on the um, policies issue that they'd like to ask, discuss? Well, I, I think Rich made a couple of suggestions yeah. with respect to page five. Yeah. Um, and I think they're good suggestions. Um, that the language um, he entered in there um, to fit in there. Uh, I think in the first one he's, he's talking about wastewater management. Mm -hmm. um, in the other one he's talking about uh, special education uh, mm -hmm. at the elementary school. So I think both his suggestions are very good. Yeah, I thought it's good that the policies are stable. We're not changing them significantly every year. And he mentions the community fund in the intro, so you know that's going to be added in there to your point, Mary. So yeah, you know, I'm happy that things are kind of we're, what we're using seems to be working because we're not rewriting it every year. You know. You right, know. and I think we're adding where it's strategic to add it. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what we. Cover the important things. Don't try to cover every little nit, right? Right. A lot of the storm state regulations would require the update of the policy of station or two, wouldn't it? It's very useful. They don't necessarily require that we update it on a regular schedule, but anytime we borrow, we're required to provide them. So, I mean, Rich is extremely on top of anything that's a requirement for borrowing because he knows how important that is. So, um, we didn't really have written financial policies before Rich came. I mean, might have had some, but they were basically out of they were some mass, generic. Yeah, mm -hmm. generic. Sketchy. <laughs> sketchy? Say sketchy. Boilerplate. Boiler <laughs> yes, boilerplate. More generic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? So I noticed he, uh, he he talks about cash management. Aren't we actively doing something with cash management, or does he want to really do cash management? I, I thought that was for the community fund. Yeah. That if that's specific. If you look at the way he wrote the note, I oh. I think it says community fund. Because we definitely are active with cash management. Does it? Does it say that? No, it doesn't say cash management on under. the introduction. No, it's in. It's under potential additions. Potential additions. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at the table of contents on one of three with his notes. Mm -hmm. He says cash management, and then he's got an arrow down. Oh, uh, he's I think yeah. Cash management. I think yeah, yeah. of control disbursement and what? investment policies. Blah, blah, blah. He's looking at investment policies because we now have a fund that we would like to get permission to grow. So, the state controls how much growth we can have in in our our eligible funds like our open funds that they're unrestricted mm -hmm. um, they do not want us to be like making money they mm -hmm. think that's like <laughs> it's bad <Why> not? <laughs> um, sometimes it Isn't happens by accident because we have no, no, no interest on earnings hand. this year that's true. Um, but but he's he's thinking the community fund since it has a, a legislative piece it has a different tool that we might be able yeah. to make that so fund grow. Are you telling me there's a ceiling on how much money we can invest and make? Uh, yes, anything? yes. Unless it's in a special fund like the retirement fund, the PARAC or the. So it would apply to the risk. Of, oh, hold on. Is it because of risk assessment? I believe so. Mm -hmm. I think that was the origin of why they set the limits and the rules. Yeah. But it, it, there's got to be something between what we have now and a true risk, right? I mean, right, yeah. something. If it's really unrestricted I mean, I, I cash and the taxpayers are willing to take I, the risk, I, I how much, how much we can make on it. You're taxing the taxpayers based on the budget you exactly. proposed. So you have to be within, I forget whether it's 5 or 8% or right, whatever. Right, they don't want us to be um, you know, collecting extra money so that we can invest it and make money, even though, I, I, I don't know, there's some sense to that, I guess, but. I think on the school the budget, it's 5%. Doesn't the state treasurer in Massachusetts invest the money, though? No, not our money. No, mm -hmm. not our money. State money. State oh, money. yes, yeah, state sure. money, yeah. Sure. And he probably does pretty well on it, or she. 
Oh, well, I hopefully, I hope so. I think <laughs> it'll be helpful for if money should is going to be sitting around anywhere, then yeah. I think we should be looking to well, make well, it. You, you, at the, one of the first meetings I came to, they were talking about how to disperse the funds to keep the risk lower. Right? Yeah, you, uh, you use a, some kind of a, an outfit that moves the money around to right. different banks so that they keep it under the threshold. That's cash management. Any other questions on the um, policies? So Rich will incorporate? Yeah, I'll let him know that you're favorable to these changes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, hopes, he hopes to join us uh, at, our next, at our meeting for next month, so. And one question on the general financial management policies. Maybe you can't answer it, but it says, <clears throat> number three said the director of finance shall prepare for approval by the investment committee, a cash and investment policy. Do you have an investment committee? No. Not currently. No, I just wonder why that was in there. You have to ask Rich. Maybe he's thinking of having you act as the investment committee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But we actually had talked yeah, last had, year. Yeah, I, I slightly remember uh, about, about it, too. About maybe we wanted to have one. one. I yeah. think that's about as far as we got. Okay. And it could be like a subcommittee of the finance committee or. Anything else? <coughs> okay, I'm gonna go on to our um, agenda. Uh, item number five, the preliminary prior fiscal year budgetary results. And we have preliminary, and I know uh, Rich has said that he hopes to have final for our next meeting in October. Um, what we do have is the preliminary for the fiscal year 24 and and when I first looked at it I was saying what we really need is the the actual for fiscal year 23 to compare to fiscal year 24 and it's it, it was part of the packet too so because I find comparing one year to the next year to the next year is really what you need to do to see uh, how we're doing and what the where the issues are. Right. Um, so, Mary, I just have a quick question. Um, this preliminary report for state, state local receipts, FY23, mm -hmm. is that actually preliminary or were these the actual, were these the final numbers? That's the, it's my understanding that's the final number yeah, because that's, that's okay. fiscal year 23. Right. I just, yeah. Yeah. Probably shouldn't have Sorry, preliminary. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, because he obviously knew, I just wanted to yeah, make fiscal sure year it, is it over. been year over year, preliminary right. over preliminary. Yeah, right, right. And I think what he's noticing that he wanted me to point out is that, you know, the trend is not going up. The trend is not totally flattening out, but we're not, we're at a point where the projections are good. Like mm -hmm. this is, this is it. The numbers are staying more stable. Every once in a while we have an odd occurrence in in one line item or mm -hmm, another mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um like this year the transfer station yeah, did very yeah, very yeah, well yeah yeah mm -hmm. I, i've sort of gone through it to see where the where the problems might be or whether we yeah. where we took in really more than we ever anticipated and obviously with fred's question uh, earnings on investments i mean yeah. that that was a question that i that i had when we had a budget of five thousand i i don't under, i'm not sure how are you are we allowed to have a budget of five thousand for the for the fiscal year and we ended up with with uh, eight hundred and eleven thousand? Yes. I mean I'm sure they'll question the eight hundred and eleven, not the five thousand. Yeah, I yeah. mean I think it and we have had years where it has been like fifteen thousand. Oh yeah, with um so I think rate, interest the, rates are zero zero. Right. So you don't want you don't want the budget, what we absolutely count on, we don't want that number to be right. high. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's looking at, you know, 85%. So he wants our projections to be 85% of the operating budget. So we're right on target, it, it looks like for that, no more than 85%. Mm -hmm. um, Jackie, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, fiscal year 24. Um, going from the bottom, one, two, three, well, from the total state, one, two, three, four, five, that has rentals, what is, uh, is that? 
We have some property that, right. that we rent right. and people pay money right, for. Right. The children's place is one of those properties. So they pay us rent. Okay. It's part of the 30-year um, agreement. Is there any housing that, does that include? The house housing goes into the housing rental revolving oh, okay. fund. Okay, it's not part of this rental. No, it's in the operating budget. Um, it's not It's not revenue that we would use other than to take care of those properties. Of what it, what it came, where it came from, yeah, so to so speak. it's in the operating budget. Okay. How about a town center plaza, is that? That's in, the op that's in that same rental fund. That's, that's part of the 74000 Yeah. Oh, no. Where, no. where are you looking? Uh, Rentals. 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 No, no. Revenue. Same money there. No. So it's just, that's just the... Uh, because that's in a, I think because it's in a revolving fund, it's not going to show up on right. this as revenue income. In other words, okay. we get revenue and then the expenses come directly out of that account. So it, it won't show up on this sheet. Yeah, I would think town center should follow the same thing, even though it's commercial, right? Right. We, we've lumped all the rentals into one. Anything we take rentals okay. in yeah. that people live in. That's different from the town property that's yeah. always been rented. Different mm -hmm. from the council yes. on aging type of thing you're exactly. saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but um, you yeah. level set those rents on, on the town center? Yeah. Like so. local break, is it? Yeah. With the landlord, right? With the landlord. Yeah, right. Yeah. So do we raise the rent or do you, Yeah, we have a we have yearly leases. And I can get you the percentage, or we can have Rachel talk about it, but there was a specific percent that we raised, we raised the rent each year now. Mm -hmm. But do we set that revenue and expense aside, kind of manage it together? Yes. So it's paying for that pot of money. So when that mm -hmm. comes in, it, it, it takes some of the maintenance, for, especially for Town Center Plaza, because we don't have Town Center Plaza maintenance in anything in the operating right, yeah. budget, so we need it for that. It also pays a percentage of the, um, I'm forgetting what we call him. We have a, uh, you have a superintendent property, property yeah. yeah. Property manager. Property, property manager. manager. Mm -hmm. And he's, I think his salary is, Richard, tell you exactly but I think it's half in the DPW budget and half out of the rental account and did they or did they the businesses there uh, were they involved with the payment of the wastewater uh, the, I mean, the septic you, you put in a, a septic system there no not at all no okay so are, are they like triple net leases on the uh, on the companies in the sense that they share in some of the maintenance or do we take care of the maintenance there's some sharing we take care of the maintenance <coughs> and instead of, they used to get a bill for like snow plowing and yeah. things like that once a year. And it was based on their actual expenses. What we did is we've raised the rents and we pay those bills. So for instance, we don't pay the bill for snow plowing. It's just included in okay. our DPW snow plowing event, but right. we include that in the rent. They, in their rental agreements, it specifically says there's certain list of things that they have to pay for. There is something like that. In there. Okay, thank you. And I want to say it's utilities other than water. What know. about standard maintenance, you know? I don't think we charge them for standard. No, okay. But I know that they have to do all their alarm systems, all, all things like that. There's a very little. I can roof bring go, you in. The roof the goes leases. bad, we have to replace it. Yes. Okay. And it is bad. So you can see it when you drive by. <laughs> Is there any money left over to pay some of the bond uh, premium, uh, interest? We're paying that out of a uh, short-term rental tax. But, but, but not out of rental from the... From the businesses, yeah. businesses? No, we haven't. There's that no. account isn't robust. I mean, it's doing fine, but it's not robust so it's enough. It's paying the tax. maintenance and the property manager. Yes. That's about it. Yeah. To the point where you're not charging the taxpayers to maintain right. the property. Sure. Uh -oh. So if I, if I want to see it in the budget with the income and expense for that property is, where do I look? It's in housing, commu in community development, and I will find it for you. We can get it for you for the next meeting. Uh, is, is, yeah. is it just like buried in there or is it, or is it a line item, you know? I don't know how Rich has it. Like, I don't know whether Town Center Plaza has its own line. Yeah. It probably, knowing Tina, it has its own account number within the revolving account. Yeah. 
so we can do run a report for you that will show you. I'm not sure we particularly care about it, so we don't we put them all in the same fund. You know, I used to beat up on Michael about in, you know revenue and expense. Season. Yes. You know, how much revenue, or how much expense for the same line items? But see who, where we are. On it. And of course, no one thinks that we're going to make money on Town Center no, Plaza. We are just trying to minimize the, the cost. <laughs> How can you set a fee if you don't know what if right. you're making? You know, well, but part of your cost. Shh, right, but part of the fee is that it is a C or D level rental space. So we're not going to get top dollar yeah. for it mm -hmm. under right. our leases. Right. And we know that. So they're reasonable leases. Well, we don't want to be losing money on it either. No. No, but it sounds like you're covering your expenses. Well, yeah, so far strategic we purpose for a larger plan. Yes. So, so. Right. I apologize. We're trying. No, don't, don't <laughs> apologize. This, this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> it's quite okay, Fred. Quite okay. <laughs> okay. So, as I said, uh, based on a, an email that I got from Rich, uh, he hopes to have the final, final finals uh, for our next meeting in October. So. Um, does anybody have any other questions on the uh, local receipt uh, information and for fiscal year 24 as compared to 23? The, the, the thing that I would be interested in too is since we, once we get the fiscal year 24, to look at that, those numbers to see how they compare to what we are anticipating for fiscal year 25. Yeah. To see whether, whether we ended up for fiscal year 24 with something way over or way less and we've, we didn't take that into account when we put together the budget for fiscal year 25, and we don't have that here. So um, that, that's something okay. that, that, that I think makes, uh, would make a lot of sense. Any other questions from committee folk? I'm going to go on to the... Uh, Items on the agenda. Let me see, just writing myself a note here. Okay. Um, we're down to old business. And let me see, the capital project committee update. I, I didn't know who, I know three of you were on it, so. One of them was missing. I'm sorry? Austin was on vacation. Missing without permission. Oh, oh, it's too oh, bad he wasn't at the list. Uh, we'll uh, catch you up. Yeah, we'll we'll catch up. Oh. <laughs> I'll talk about it. Uh, I'll probably say 95% of the meeting will talk about Rock Harbor. Mm. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. That was the focus of the meeting, if I'm correct. Yeah. And um, just to let everybody know where the, we stand financially on it, the uh, money that was set aside for Rock Harbor was $1.3 million. Um, today they've spent 535000 and it looks like they got another 196 um, committed uh, for the permitting and the design, but it has not been spent as of at this point, uh, which gives them uh, 765,000 left to spend. Mm -hmm. And um, if they uh, proceed with all the projects, that would be about 200,000 for the engineering and permitting, and I'd leave another 570 for the uh, construction of the project. Um, we're looking at three options. The first one was doing the uh, full ADA um, renovation on the south dock. Uh, the north dock is pretty much complete. Um, it's about 30 um, berths, I think. And the uh, south dock, I think, is 12. Uh, I think there's one transient dock um, associated with two, for a total of 13. Um, that was running in the range of 560 to $636,000. The second option was to go with a uh, longer ramp, which would, because there's two problems down there. Uh, the first problem is the steepness of the ramp. At, at low tide. At low tide, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and the second problem is the uh, south dock on the south end, I'd say the last six slips at low tide, it rides up on the um, sand because um, it's so low at that point. So it starts to turn a little bit and follows the direction of the sand there. Um, so to go with a longer ramp, uh, but not taken into the ADA requirements, which are not required. I should make a point of that. The ADA is not required um, to be updated down there. 
um, but that still is going to cost 130 to 508 thousand uh, dollars. The third option was to do nothing and not spend any more money. Um, what would, would happen with the grant money? Um, 760. We've already spent all the grant money. Uh oh. oh. Yeah, this is part of the $1.3 million allocation right. from the town. Oh, oh okay. So the basically. The 750000 was returned. The 150000 we spent on the design of the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the money not spent would basically go back to the town at that point. Um, so we talked about a lot um, at the meeting, um, listened to um, people uh, voice concerns. Um, so like I said, the, the two concerns are the steepness and the floating dock. Um, not being floating at the end of the, at the south ramp. Um, the discussion is kind of laid on the fact that who uses it at low tide? Mm -hmm. uh, and is this really a problem? Um, and the other discussion is it's an awful lot of money to spend for 12 slips. Um, you know, was it beneficial for the town as a whole uh, versus the 12 slips? Um, so. We didn't vote, we didn't make any decisions on it at the time. We talked about other options. Um, how much further that's gonna go, I don't know at this point. Um, I, I'll have the answer to both by the next meeting. I have the answer, so I've gotten like half, half done. Okay. Um, but I think Rich and I, our issue is that, you know, when this was planned in 2016 and 2017 and when it was voted in 2018 the primary driver was getting those new docks and floats mm -hmm. we've done that mm -hmm. right we know we can't do a building there yeah, we, that didn't work right we know the state won't allow us to do some of the other things that were in the original plan like the walking path around and all that so we're getting down to the to the point where <laughs> we have so many other capital priorities in the town right now that it just doesn't seem it doesn't seem useful to do this if we don't have to do it and so for me it would be like okay so we could save 765,000 and either put that towards the next dredge which come you know it comes up like clockwork every 7 to 10 years or put it towards another project like wastewater or something else so Town, oh, that's right. We have a lot in the capital plan. We have town landings that need to be upgraded, and we have drainage money. We have money from the USDA that has matching funds. Um, but all of our landings are in very shabby shape and really need to, So Rich was thinking we could ask town meeting to move that appropriation over to landings. It's not that this isn't a need for... 12 slip holders but for me it's not a critical need because there is literally no necessity to go down to your boat at dead dead low tide when you can't go anywhere mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know even though the pitch is steep people can go up and down so I don't know is there a, is there an issue with the boats resting on the bottom there is, there is. so that okay. is an so issue well the boats are down that's an issue, and those docks will um, degrade faster if they're sitting on sand, and they warp if they sit on sand. So, but you know, we paid for all the dock replacements north and south for four hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, I mean, really, we could buy a whole new set of docks <laughs> for the price um, and still have money left over. So, but that periodic dredging won't solve the problem of the boats being out of water. No, because the state will not allow, I do have an answer to that. We, they won't allow us to come, they won't allow us to come around the dock area. They but, but where I was asking Jackie though is, is there a problem for the owners of the boats with the boats resting on the? No. No, there's not, okay, that was my question. Well, okay. I mean, they prefer the to be more. Yeah. From here and well, from Florida yep. to New, Nova Scotia Tidal harbors where the, the tide goes out and the boats sit on the bottom. Oh, yeah, you can look over on the bay side. I understand that. But I'm just asking whether there is an it's issue not, with It's not an unusual. It's not, I don't no, think it hurts the unusual. boats. It no. does make yeah. the, um, the floats degrade faster. That's all. And I don't know how much faster. We haven't yeah, asked I that wonder question. I about that, too. Because it's pretty gentle, the tide goes It down. is. <laughs> sit on the bottom, the tide goes down. Yeah, but then if you go down and you're in a slip, 
and then your boat goes over. Does oh, it go it over to the next guy, the, or does uh, it, you know? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. I don't okay. see any of that. Right. Actually, no. the boats seem, even at dead low, they seem to be yeah. pretty, much, stable. Uh, and pretty much in the water. Yeah, they take them out itself, it's mm. every winter and put them in every spring. So they're, the you know, they're yeah. safe they're for, the, for the bad season of storms. And Is any of this East Ham's issue, or would this be the boat owner's issue? <laughs> so it's not a boat. Well, I mean, that's the question I asked town meeting in 2018. Yeah. Like, I mean, we voters could have made the choice in 2018 not to replace the docks. That was that was the issue. It was like, do you want to spend the money to do this? Because if you do, we've got, you know, these are expenses that we're going to have to do. If you don't, then we can just take up those old dangerous docks and not have our part of the harbor. And people did vote to proceed. Um, it wasn't the most popular vote, though. I mean, I look back at the numbers, and we got a two-thirds majority, but it wasn't a huge, I mean, I, I know some of you have been coming to town meetings. There, it, there were at least 80-so people who voted against it. So that's, that's a high number for us. Usually, if we get more than 20, I know that something's wrong. And, and the South Docks weren't separate from the North Docks in that vote. They no. Were, they were all together. Right. We're just talking about, I mean, yeah. the North Docks, there's no problems there. They're right. all fixed and everybody's happy. Yeah. So how, how many boats, uh, how many slips are there in the North versus about the 30 some in the, in the North. North and then 12. 12. Oh, so that's a very small piece. Right. To spend 500,000. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it's a lot of money for a very small return. And it sounds that's like, Jackie, what you're suggesting, diverting the funds to something that's going to benefit a greater number of people. Yeah, you know. it's. I mean, it's a. It's difficult because obviously, but I think that you know, not having the harbor master building down there, not being able to do some of the other improvements that we wanted to do. I mean, the other thing that Rich and I talked about is, do we want to do some of the improvements to the parking area and spruce up things a little bit that would allow slipholders to have some benefit too? But I don't know. We've been struggling with this for a while. I mean, it's, you know, it's 2024. So how is the final decision going to be made? So what I'm asking for is the Capital Projects Committee to opine. Once I get all the answers to the questions, mm -hmm. they will opine to me, and then we will take that recommendation to the select board and let them hash it out too, because it is... You know, we are not going to be, if, if we say no, then we're not going to be doing something that we thought we were going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more, you know, it's a wider discussion. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is there anything else you wanted to comment on as from the uh, Capital Projects Committee? Um, town Hall's wrapped up mm -hmm. at this point. Thank the, God. Um, it's good. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Thing was the water project. I guess the tanks going up. And, uh, tanks going up. Uh, actually, the select board, um, Jackie Tepper, is coming to their meeting this Monday to give an update on the tank. Great. Is it up? It's up. Yes. Yeah, I saw it from Marconi Beach. Last week or week or yeah, you can see it from a couple of spots. If you go to Fort Hill and you look to the <laughs> left, supposedly. <laughs> we <can see> it. <laughs> I went today to look, but it's too cloudy. I couldn't see right. it. And, <laughs> and like I said, like this is kind of like Rock Harbor. Like who's going to be at Fort Hill with the 360 <laughs> degree views and then turn to the left and go, oh yeah, that tower really wrecks everything. <laughs> <laughs> if you go up to Marconi where the Marconi station is, you look down and you can see it. Okay. Oh, we'll have Corita come in and make Perfect designs view. on it so it looks like you're going into Boston. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of positive responses on that. Painting. Yeah. I know. I like that. I do. The purpose is to make the elementary here. school kids no, no, go no. in and paint it. No. Okay. <laughs> We're not painting anything. <laughs> it costs like a lot of money to paint that tower, and the, we had this long discussion. Unfortunately, I went through the same discussion in Wellfleet as a select board member mm. 20 years ago, mm. right? So by the time I got here, I was smarter. <laughs> and when they said, you know, we should have the artists do a contest, or we, no, no, and no, because <laughs> no one will ever agree that it's good, right? Mm. right. There'll be people that love it. There'll be yeah. people that hate it. This is tank white. That's the color, <laughs> tank white. It blends with the sky better than anything else. Yeah. 
Not even least him. Uh, no. <laughs> logo or anything. A turnip. They wanted a turnip. No, when no. the Korea Tower I would have been, happened, I would have been in it favor was of ridiculous that. how many people hated it. It just people would drive in and out it's, of Boston. It's just something for people to react to right. that yeah. we don't need them necessarily to react to. No. Is my yeah. view. The majority of towns want them to completely disappear. Yes. So you pick colors so and if, if you go to Dennis it's funny because they painted all their tanks blue and there's quite a few of them and they're very obvious they're not hidden at all mm -hmm. and you know it makes me as a person who's sensitive to color it makes me crazy because it's never the same blue as the sky oh. no day <laughs> whereas tank white kind of it really does blend it's like someone did a scientific study but, but we're not at the point to paint the first one at yet, right? We have to repaint the first one. I thought one. it was 20 years, they told us. Um, they said 15 years. Oh. But, you know, it's, I, know I don't know, the I salt know environment. I don't know. They'll make up some excuse. But <laughs> but it's it's looking like we will be painting it within the 15-year period. Is that interior and exterior? or just? Yes. Interior? Well, they clean the exterior. I don't know if they paint it or they just... Jackie was just mentioning this to me, Steve, and I can't remember. I think it's a coating. I think there's a coating on the inside, and they paint the outside. Sandwich just I, painted theirs, didn't they, on Route, yeah. route uh, 3, I was going to say, Route 6. Right? Route 6? Yeah. That was what a big color? effort. White, white, I think. Right. White. It looked better when it was gray. It looked like more Star Wars type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> like but a, that one like blended. The gray star. one blended pretty yeah. well. I was say the Death Star. It looks like the Death Star. <laughs> yeah. see, see, you don't Which get is an agreement not good to <laughs> <laughs> So we just don't talk about it ever again. <laughs> okay. This is the last discussion. Rolling back 30 seconds on the <laughs> Oh, dear. Okay, uh, do you have anything else, Steve, or you? No, that's no, it. No. Thank you very much. Um, uh, item B under old business is the community fund update, and we have discussed that uh, today, and uh, so we'll be waiting to see what the select board puts together for their management plan, and, um, we, and we'll have to figure out how we're going to, uh, ho hopefully to have something, if the warrant article for, for, uh, May mm -hmm. for, for, for the funding part of it. Um, I'm going on to see dispatch and school study updates, and those are the two intermunicipal uh, items that mm -hmm. I know we're in the process of working with. So well, I'm going to do school first. No, okay. So the school study is um, basically East Ham. Brewster and Orleans have put in money, contributed right. money, and we have an MOU. Peter um, from Brewster, the town manager from Lombardi. Brewster, Lombardi, was going to be doing the RFP out. So I don't know the status of that, but it should mm -hmm. be sometime this fall. Mm -hmm. And the dispatch, um, we have had a, not a, uh, we've had an interesting second comer. So we had the idea of forming our own dispatch you know unit with a new building mm -hmm. on a in, in piece town of land. here yes and the sheriff's office has come to us saying that they would like to actually expand their operation and they have they think they have the capacity to take the outer cape town so now we're talking about that issue and and rich is has had several meetings with them on that there there are some very specific financial parameters mm -hmm. around that that he wants to discuss. Do they have sp uh, sp land space or would it be a part of something that they have already? In it's building? part of something that they have already. Oh, okay. yeah, so, so it wouldn't would be, be much it, easier. It would be wouldn't be building anything. Mm, that's correct. So how would it work if it was down in Barnstable? We're just talking about the towns out here. How the, it would, the dispatch center would be located in Barn down in Barnstable? Mm, or the, no. It's oh, oh. in um, Bourne. Camp Edwards. Okay. In Bourne? Yeah. yeah. Buzz, Camp Edwards. Yeah. Oh, right. Camp Edwards. It's the Barnstable. It's a Demont phenomenal. Sure. It's a phenomenal facility. I've been there when Wellfleet was thinking of, of transferring over, and they did. So their fire is already at hmm. Sheriff's. And the only difference is when you dial, that I have seen, like when Dennis switched over to it, is when you dial 911. Um, 
your dispatcher will say is do you need police or fire mm -hmm. so fire EMT so if you say fire EMT it goes to the mm -hmm. county if you say police it stays mm -hmm. local unless we can get them to take police they don't dispatch police right now mm -hmm. but as Rich will explain to you police has a much lower level of dispatch training mm -hmm. um, equipment everything <coughs> is much lower uh, the bar is much lower in terms of dispatchers who do fire and EMT have to be able to tell people how to stop bleeding, tell people how to do CPR. To, they, mm -hmm. they are trained and the equipment is totally different too. Mm -hmm. So it's a much higher standard of care. Um, mm -hmm. So if they take fire and we keep police, that's one plan. If they would take police too, that's another. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. If we keep police, then we don't have the dark station, which is always a concern for people, mm -hmm. um, that there's no physical person mm -hmm. at night. There. So, so what's the timing on mm -hmm. all this? I would say that we'll be, he'll, we'll be trying to make the decisions this winter, mm -hmm. because if we did switch over, it would probably be next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So. But Jackie, do you think that um, the better approach is that um, police stay here and fire go with the uh, centralized dispatch? I think um, the chief thinks that that's the best way to go. And Rich and I are still just gathering info in terms of, you know, what that means, what that means to the budget, what it means to service levels. Like, we want both, right? We want good service. We want the same service or better service, but we also don't want to replicate costs either. Part of the reason you would move is right. to, so, um, so we talked about, you know, some other possibilities too, but he'll walk you through. Um, once it becomes more clear, I think we need to get um, what we're trying to do right now is narrow down what are our options, how much will those options cost, mm -hmm. will they save money in the long term, I don't know. In the short term, there are incentives for us mm -hmm. to either build our own or... <laughs> Financial incentives. Financial incentives, yes. But, you know, sometimes... Well, Sometimes you have to weigh, financial you have to incentives financial, are yeah. used to yeah. get you involved in something, and then five years down the it road, costs yeah. more. Yeah. yeah, you just have to weigh the financial incentives yes. to the long-term incentives and the details. Costs. You know, and those the devil really is in the details. So we'd have to have an agreement that that would um, allow us to negotiate things, and so it's complicated, but it's it's moving might be interesting to find out uh, what the experience with any towns close to us that have moved what their experience has been. They love it. To bench, oh, good, to the benchmark that. Fire or? No, they don't do police, so yeah. it's just so fire. fire. Okay. It sounds like Wellfleet is doing that? Wellfleet's doing fire, Orleans is doing fire. Interesting, okay. And we're similar in call volume to Orleans. Mm -hmm. And that, and that Dispatch to the EMTs as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the tricky part. Okay, um, we're down to agenda item number 6D, and I did attend the most recent uh, Nauset Regional School District uh, meeting on the an assortment of things, but one of them is regarding the draft agreement, and it's my understanding that it's going to be sent to the select board for all the four towns. For Did they have the final draft agreement? Yeah, I think they have. They're, they're, it's in the process of finalizing it, and they're planning on sending it to the select boards of all four towns. Did they make changes based just, on Just the very small changes. Okay. So what we've done, I don't know if... Jerry wants no, to talk about I know about Jerry it. put together his thoughts. Do you want to talk about it, Jerry, or you want me to talk about the process? Oh, you, you can talk about the process better than, than Okay, than and then I you know. can answer this specific question. So right. basically what we did is we took the original Nauset agreement between the four towns, mm -hmm. 
and we overlaid all the changes that the school made in red. And then Jerry took it and he made changes in blue. And then he added a page of notes that explain all his changes. And then he went back and added the Monomoy budget process because he liked the Monomoy agreement budget the, process. The, the timing, I think it was the timing process. Right, so now we have that so that you can see what's original, what's the schools, what's Jerry's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know if we'll put in a separate color for the Monomoy stuff or we'll just leave that in your notes. And then I will be able to send that to you and to Brewster because Peter Lombardi would like to see it too. Okay, okay. And mm -hmm. visually it's the only way I could think of doing it where we would, even though it took time because Lori Gillespie Lee, we, we gave her this project to do and she did a great job. But um, is to be able to track it all in colors because otherwise you wouldn't know yeah, who, who is suggesting what. Yeah, what. Right, right, exactly. And Jerry can talk about specifics that he changed. So but I, think I, I, I guess my only comment is that I think we would like to see what what is going to be sent out to the, the f f four towns for review when it gets to that point. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I will send you what we're sending out, okay. and then as soon as they send anything to me, I will send okay, you that. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay, you, 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 you're on, Jerry. Oh, okay. Well, my, um, I guess my biggest changes, I'll just go through briefly what the changes were. I changed the uh, quorum requirement to require at least a representative from three of the towns. I didn't do four because I didn't want to give a town a uh, monopoly, but I didn't want Brewster and East Ham or Brewster and Orleans to call a meeting and not include uh, East Ham and, and, and Wellfleet because they had more than 50% 50, 50, uh, of the votes. I also um, changed the requirement to passing the budget to being a two thirds vote, but they have to have at least one representative from each town vote in the, fir the infirm affirmative to have it go through. Uh, that was, um, that's a fairly uh, <laughs> sticky point that people may totally disagree with because it gives a town veto power on getting the school budget out of the committee. Then I also suggest that um, if you want to change, um, it, when we do our budget, when there's a line item and you have to and you want to transfer funds from one light item to another, uh, Jackie has to come in and beg you guys, the finance committee, to approve it. Uh, the school budget is very different in that we, um, if you remember way back, uh, the school committee wanted to uh, put a air conditioning system in the uh, middle school for $350,000 and then because the complaints from the town, they pulled it out, but that $350,000 went who knows where. So uh, I, I would require, now this was not my my really tough one, Fred, Fred would, would yell at me for going this way, but to, to require a two thirds vote with an affirmative vote from at least one member from each town to transfer any funds from one budget item to another for the school committee. That would put a little bit more of a constraint, uh, constraint on them. Uh, the, uh, the Monomoy numbers, you know, October 1, uh, requ and requiring them to have participation from uh, the finance committee and select boards of each town in preparing the budget, that's one of the requirements. Uh, January 15th is when they have to get the budget on or about January 15th. They have to get the budget to us uh, and uh, for, for us to, to look at. Those are, uh, I think, the, the biggest uh, change. Oh, the, the chairman. The chairman of the committee has to change every year uh -huh. and um, it has to rotate among, among the towns so that you would have the chairman and the vice chairman rotating mm -hmm. uh, every year with uh, every fourth year there'd be an East Ham chair and it's and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, the committee itself is proposing to increase the number on the on the 
committee from 10 to 11 to give Wellfleet another Vote. member so they have two, but right. there, uh, there still would be just 10 votes. So Wellfleet's vote would not be 1.4 weight, but a 0.7 weight for each of the two, uh, two members. And I think that we, we, you know, we fully agree with that. I um, would add that they can change change from uh, sixth to 12th grade in the Nauset regional system to any other number without requiring a new, uh, a new agreement. New agreement so right. that, for example, if they wanted to shift uh, uh, seventh and eighth to the high school and bring sixth grade back to the elementary schools, they could do that. If they wanted to bring fifth grade into the middle school because of how numbers are shifting, they can do that without doing a whole, a whole um, a new agreement. They need a two-thirds vote uh, in order to do that. But uh, so we don't have to go through this again. They have a, uh, a the committee had a five-year review of the the agreement, and they the committee would appoint a subcommittee, not necessarily members of the uh, of the school committee, uh, to review that. Uh, I would, my suggestion would require that that committee also has to have one representative from each town appointed by the select board. Uh, those are the things that uh, I put in to try and do a little bit more uh, control, um, uh, get, our, get the information earlier. I can remember as I have the same problem on the select board when I was on the finance committee, you got the school budget one week before we were going to the printer. So they really couldn't, you had no input or, or nothing to do with it. So those are the big, uh, big items I suggested. They may or may not be even legal in Massachusetts. I didn't care. I just wanted to put things down. This is what we would, this is what we would like. That, that's not and like I, you, Jerry, do not care. I know, well, I didn't, well, I, I do no, care, worry. except I wanted that's to right. put, put down, I wanted to put down what we wanted we were kind of disappointed we were disappointed in oh the other thing i the other big thing i put in was that they had to with the committee when they present the budget uh to us they have to prevent the present the assessment for each town using both methods and the then the, the alternative versus the statutory they would have to present it for both and yeah. then it's up to the towns and town meetings if four of them vote for the alternative that's the assessment yeah, yeah. if four of them do not vote for the alternative then it's the statutory one but that decision would be left up to the towns and town meeting not specifically to the committee as they have and that's a major change and i don't know if that's legal or not but but I think they need to know that we were very upset with what they did and, you know, select, they can promise whatever they want, but there'll be a new committee, there'll be a new superintendent, there'll be new select boards, there'll be new finance committees, and we want to try and set this up to try and prevent that mistake, not mistake, but that event from happening again. So that's generally the big things that I did. Yeah, and I have I have a question. It also includes, if my if I'm correct, the uh, three year rolling average. The three year rolling average is in there. That was okay, in there yeah. from the, the 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 on the draft that the the school committee put out. That's <laughs> now, what got us into this whole thing. That's right. I'm yeah. Sorry, what the did you say, Jackie? That's what got us into this whole. This whole thing. Started yeah. the whole thing. So the three year rolling average works for all debt service. Works for. Uh, even if you have the statutory uh, uh, assessment, anything that's above the statutory assessment that has to go over the statutory assessments don't give you enough for the budget, that would be done with the three-year rolling average. Mm -hmm. If you went with the alternative assessment, the whole thing would be done on the three-year rolling average. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, timing <laughs> of providing the budget information to the various select board finance committee uh, committees Jan, Jan, january 15th it's on or about january 15th it has to be presented the proposed budget has to be presented it has to start they have to start on or about october 1 preparing the budget and they have to include consultation with the select board and or finance committee of each town 
that was directly from the Monomoy yeah, agreement. Correct. I vir virtually copied the Monomoy right, agreement right. on that. For the, for the timing. For the timing and yeah. having to consult with the select boards. Right. Thank you very much, Jerry. Is, does anybody have any other questions on what we're in the middle of here? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's got it covered. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't. I mean, that's, he, that's just one town. Yeah, yeah. So, there are four. You know, mm -hmm. every town's going to have their own input. The, the committee's been working hard to try to get a process to take input from the four towns. And then, uh, you know, try to put it all in there and go back to the towns. It looks like it's not going to be ready for this town. Yeah, right, next that's right. That's, town that's, yeah. It'll be yeah. a year. They put together a timeline. Yeah. And it's very complicated and, and so many different, uh, era, I don't know what you want to call them, um, different peoples have to be involved. And it's, it's the towns, it's the school committees, it's the... DESI, the Department of, of Elementary and School Education, uh, it's the, the school, com it's just, you know, goes here, goes there, this, they do this, you know, it's just, the timeline is such that it doesn't look, and, and the, I, we've been told DESI takes, can take six months to, re to review it. So the chances of anything for, for this May are Im impossible based on what people right. think. Imagine if we had, if we could say to someone, it's going to take us six months to review something. Yeah, but I'm just telling you that that, that their the attorney that Nancy Company has said that that to be to not uh, be could be uh, surprised that it might take six months for Desi. Yeah. Well, uh, Jackie, I think it might be worthwhile to let them know that Brewster, Orleans, and uh, East Ham have also hired, oh, yes, hired, hired services of, uh, of our, our own attorney to, to look at this process uh, outside of the attorney that the uh, uh, regional school committee has hired. I, yeah, I did let Brooke know that. Uh -oh. yeah. Yeah. That's not going to speed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least we're not doing four attorneys for one from each town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Good point. Right? <laughs> always looking at the that boys. would add yeah. another year. Yeah, yeah that would boys. add another year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and while we're while we're in the middle of talking about this, I just want to thank Peter, and Tom, and Steve, uh, for we the four of us have been attending meetings of different different committees, different times, in New Orleans, in East, I mean, it's just it, it, insane. It really has been insane from my perspective. And uh, so I, I just want to thank Peter and Tom and Steve mm -hmm. for being very involved in this whole process of, uh, of meeting. Sounds like you yeah. too. Thank yourself. Oh, oh, oh I've been, but I'm, I'm just thanking them. And I, I kind of think with uh, this regional school budget, it, it, that's it's going to have to be that in the future too. It, uh, the, there's going to have to be involvement from the finance committees during their budget process. And actually, if there had been in, more in the past, I don't think we'd have this, um, you know, feel so strongly that that they're dumping the budget on us at the last minute. Because mm -hmm. actually, you know, uh, last year when we went through it with them, we could see the budget uh, progress through the, yep. through the stages. So. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think there should be representation from the finance committees. So much of the problem, Peter, is, has been communication, Right. Mm -hmm. I think. And, and we, we didn't have it. I think part of what I wrote and part of what we want to try and do is get that, yeah. you know, communication within the process. Mm -hmm. I should mention, too, we, you know, we have two strong uh, representatives on the school committee, on the regional school committee now. I think it's going to be a big help for East Ham. Um, more is more is really involved, and she'll. I think she'll come to this committee. And okay, thank you very much, Jerry. Any other questions on the uh, agreement, draft agreement? Okay, um, I'm going to go on to the agenda item number seven: new business. 
And um, at the select board meeting a week ago, uh, the uh, agreement was made and the assessing uh, department provided information regarding the tax rate for the coming fiscal year of 25. Um, the fiscal year 25 tax rate is been set for $7.71 per thousand. Uh, that compares to our current tax rate for this fiscal year of 24, which is currently $7.01. And, um, and I, I would, I, I'm going to give a little presentation of my, my from, on this matter today. I have some grave concerns regarding the process, not the process, but what we are finding ourselves in as far as tax rates are concerned. Um, the calculation that is used to come up with the tax rate uh, takes into account new growth, and our new growth in town here has been declining for the past two years. Um, probably... No, no, it hasn't, Mayor. Yeah, yeah that's... That, which, at the assessing office here, the new growth is, is de has declined for the past two years. I, I have it from the assessing office, their presentation. Yeah, I actually have that slide, too. Yeah, yeah right. right. Historical yeah, new yeah. growth. Right, yeah. But compared to what it was five years ago, oh, like, yeah, I'm it just was saying flat that for year 20 year. years. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm just saying that it has okay. decreased, decreased for the last two years. Um, the commercial property in town... Um, has also been decreasing. Uh, it was only 4.1% a number of years ago. It is now 2.9%. So if you're looking to raise, not raise taxes, but have commercial aspect of your town paying taxes, it's always nice to have a commercial aspect of the town, and it's our commercial is decreasing. And so there's a much heavier requirement for the, those of us here to be paying uh, the taxes. Um, the median single-family home uh, is uh, currently uh, $728,600, and um, they, they're, that median family home is going to be paying $676 more for this coming year than they paid last year. Um, that that when you take into account, we're, from my perspective, I would like to see a town here that is diverse with young people and with many older people and middle-aged people. So the younger people are going to be having a harder and harder time. And if you're an older person, I, I, I've been retired for 25 years. I live on a fixed income. Probably many of the people in town, given the age of the people in town, are also on fixed incomes. So I have some concerns about that. So the, the uh, residential tax exemption that was presented at the same select board meeting um, was, was not passed. It was, uh, the vote was three to one. Um, so that is not going to be put into place. We're, we are the only town that does not have it going, well, Wellfleet, Truro, and Provincetown have the RTE mm -hmm. in, in place. Uh, and I can understand why uh, we, you know, many people feel that if we put it in place, it would be divisive, and I can see that that, that, is, that is the case. So I've been racking my brain, to be quite honest with you, trying to figure out a way to come up with some way to help the people that we need to help. Um, we're not, wouldn't be doing it with the RTE that didn't pass. Um, and we've... We have the community fund, um, and I, I'm wondering whether there is a way to figure out if we put the RTE in place, what the amount of money would that would we, we would need the town would need to help the younger people that need the help, or the older people that are on fixed income, depending upon what their financial situations are, to figure out what that amount of money we would need. Yeah, to to try to raise in some fashion and perhaps use some free cash into the community fund to help pay for for the people that we need to help. Um, I, I'm 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 just I just feel that we are uh, getting to the point where uh, we are having some some issues with. 
people trying to pay their taxes. And um, with, with the assessed value, my, my house went up 50%. My assessed value went up 50% in the last three or four years. My house insurance, because of that its assessment, has now this year went up $1,000 just a thousand more dollars just to have my house insurance um, obviously it's based on the value that there I have of the house um, so I'm 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 opening I first I wanted to tell you what the tax rate was I wanted to tell you that the RTE did not pass um, and I'm just wondering whether anybody else here feels that that the, we need to figure out a way to help the people that we want to keep in this town be a, a financially able to stay here. And I don't know what other people's thoughts are, but that's that's my spiel for the day. Can I ask a question about the residential tax exemption? Sure. Um, what's the process where the decision was made that it was voted down? It's a select board decision. It, wait a minute, okay. So, the Board of Assessors makes a recommendation every year to the select board, and the select board makes the decision. Mm -hmm. That happens every August, usually, beginning of September, late August. When the residential tax exemption came up as an issue that people wanted us to look at, we, Rich and I, asked the select board to commit to discussing it in December or January and making a decision in that time frame because it would take us at least six months to prepare for the residential tax exemption. Right. The residential tax exemption is not automatic. You have to come in to the assessor's office and prove your residency every single year in order to get it and you have to apply for it, right? So it's a huge amount of work for so we'd have a new person. So, so we've calculated the expense of it and um, determined that we need four to six months minimum to get it off the ground. So they agreed. So every year um, for the past, I think this is the third year, they discuss it at a meeting in December, January, give us an indication of what they're thinking, and then Rich and I know that you know we're going to not have it for this whole year or we're going to start preparing for it for this year. So the legal vote comes in August, but we've asked them to really let us know in December or January what they are thinking. Because the board, well, the board could change in that um, space of time, but not. It actually did this year. It did this year, yeah. Yeah. I can, I can say that it was hugely beneficial in the city of Boston yes. um, where they were having this housing crisis that you're talking about Mary um, and the residential tax exemption for people working and living in Boston um, I experienced it and <clears throat> so I kind of got sticker shock here with our very low tax rate because I was getting a 50 percent discount in the city of Boston for living in Boston and working in Boston. Um, I'm just, and maybe this is not, it's just a question. Um, would this be something that would go before town meeting in the form of? No. no. Okay. It is the one of the few decisions that the select board gets to make by Massachusetts general law. Okay. All right. I think the other thing to think about too, Kate, when you're, you're when you're thinking about the RTE, unlike the community fund, the RTE is not targeted relief for those who need it most. So, for instance, people that aren't on a fixed income, to Mary's point, that have plenty of money qualify for an RTE mm -hmm. and would get it. You know, we've seen that in other states. You know, politicians live in California, take it in California and in Maryland. You know. Um, uh, unlike the community fund, which is where Jackie and Rich are going, which would provide targeted relief for those that need it most, mm -hmm. okay? And I, and I think that's where a lot of folks are recognized. I think everything Mary articulated is, 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 is a good point. You know, people need relief, especially in our town where we have so many people of a senior age. You know, I think it's two-thirds of our town are mm -hmm. over 60, you know, maybe a little bit higher. 
And those that are on fixed incomes, you know, they are struggling to, to pay for So how do we help them, but help the people who need it most mm -hmm. and not just peanut butter it around? Mm -hmm. and young, because young in other families. towns, uh, I'm sorry, in other towns, if we look throughout the Cape, I have yet to see any data that says RTE is solving the problem they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And towns have asked for it, and I know Wellfleet, I think, right now is commissioning a study to go off and have UMass look at the value of RTE because what we've seen down the Cape is they have it, it's a short-term relief mm -hmm. and but over time the problem continues to grow yeah. and so the tendency is to raise the RTE you know if you look at the housing bill that was just passed at the state level it provided authority correct me if I'm wrong Jack to raise the RTE as high as, high as 50 percent now yeah. That's a significant mm. jump. Because it was so 35, I, I think. It was 35. Yeah, I was, I was interested in just the data about it. Because well, I only experienced <laughs> it in Boston where sure. firefighters and police couldn't afford to stay so, in the city of Boston. So if I so. can interrupt, because I think we could discuss this you sure. know, forever. Um, the, you will get the data every December. So they prepare, Rich prepares a full spreadsheet with what the break-even point is. It's not going to go to every resident. If you have a home of a higher value, then you will not be eligible for the residential exemption. So there's always a break, breakout rate. Our point, Rich and mine right now, is that if you do it now, when we are like 57 to whatever, when we're almost, we're close to 50-50, we're a little over 50-50 then the benefit to residents is going to be very small compared to the impact to the part-time resident taxpayer. Unlike, you know, Provincetown that's 85% non-resident or Wellfleet that's 75% non-resident, those are easy. A Wellfleet resident will get $1,000 off of their taxes and the non-resident only has to pay 200 more. That's kind of a no-brainer. But it's not a no-brainer when you have to pay $1,000 for a non-resident taxpayer to get $200 for a resident. Because on the second year, we're going to go up $600. And your taxes are going to go up $400. You see what I'm saying? Cool. Yeah. So it, exactly. it's just, I think what Tom is saying is perfectly reasonable. Once you get, it's the first year, you might notice it. And then your taxes are going to still go up every year. Um, and I think we have to think about the young family issue very seriously, Mary, because we are giving young families a huge subsidy with the child care. <clears throat> so if you have three children, then we're giving you $30,000 a year for your little kids. Pre-K. Pre-K. And then when they go to school, we're giving them $75,000 a year in education because that's what it's costing the people who don't have children. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're 65% retired and <laughs> that helps us mm -hmm. keep the tax, tax rate lower. Because if we have more families and children, mm -hmm. they unfortunately, they're fabulous, but they're expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think when Jamie talks about that, it makes me uncomfortable because I can't give a 65-year-old a $10,000 right, tax right, relief. Right. But if you have a child, you get that every year mm -hmm. for three years or However, two years. However, age, age of the child. So I, I think we're, we're doing everything we can. And I think with the housing um, ideas that we have, I know it takes time, but I think we'll be able to address sort of the helping young families stay here. But we can't keep um, having one group against the other because we all, we all use services not equally. I mean, some people may use one service a lot, some people never use that service. You know, people over 65 are paying for the education. The part-time resident taxpayers are keeping our tax rates low because they don't use that whole educational incentive, which costs a lot of money. So it's a mixed bag, right? It's not, not, none of this is simple or easy. And I guess what Rich and I are cautioning the board of, it's an easy, easy win politically to vote for the residential tax exemption mm -hmm. because the people that are voting at town meeting are gonna be residents and they're gonna get a tax break. Mm -hmm. And I think they're being very brave because they're trying to think about it holistically. They're trying to think about it 
as, you know, what makes sense, you know, what makes sense and how do we, the same thing that you're both saying, how do we get assistance to people who need assistance, like people who have childcare costs of $18,000 a year or whatever, and not have to punish people, mm -hmm. other people. In, in, order to do, all, in order to do it. Exactly. Or, or at least it's like the wastewater thing. How do we get wastewater with the least amount of financial pain? How do we get maybe the residential tax exemption with the least amount of financial pain? pain? And that would be if the numbers get skewed out. And the numbers are pretty consistent. We are pretty consistent as a community staying in our 50-50, mm -hmm. yeah. 60-40 mm -hmm. some odd bubble. Um, and until we get over 60, they've decided it that was 60, they're, 40 was the, yeah, yeah. they're going to not look at it. Mm -hmm. um, Jamie being the outlier, and I think she's just representing a, a piece of the population that just wants the relief, period. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I, I totally get it. As a taxpayer, I get it. Um, but so part of that $676, mm -hmm. that's, that's the million-dollar override. That's the school. And... And so, it, so I I agree with you, and and I, I agree with with the uh, the decision on the RTE. But I was I'm as I said I was racking my brain trying to figure out a way if by not doing the RTE but providing some uh, relief to the people that need it. And since we have the community fund, right. to figure out fund how much we could, how much. Um, we could um, would would be needed for the folks that would need it to know how much to put into the community fund. I mean, I don't know how we would guess that. We can we can tell you the people that aren't paying their taxes now, like what that percentage is and how much money that is. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't tell you how many people are struggling but also paying their taxes because they're great citizens and they're going to pay their taxes and then, you know. So I don't I don't know how we get that because I was just thinking that money into the community, community fund, fund. would raise our taxes. And um, yes, <laughs> unless we use free cash, but then free we cash, use free cash, free, but free cash, money. you'd have to take you're taking free cash away from the capital budget. So then we'd have to raise taxes for that. I mean, it is just it, it's just something we need to take a deep breath and keep looking at and keep looking at closely. I just went to the One Cape Summit today and um, an, an unbelievable, mind-blowing workshop on housing mm. where it shows how we have basically been doing the wrong thing since World War II. In what, what way? In trying to create housing in a certain way that makes no sense because the more houses we have spread out, the more roads we have, the more pipe we have, the more police we have, the more fire we have. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it just gave us kind of a new roadmap, which was so interesting to me. So there are very brilliant people looking at this. This is just not our problem. Um, and I get it. You know, we may have to put off some things because we mm -hmm. can't afford them. Mm -hmm. We may be getting to that point. Well, that's what I'm concerned about. But oh. that's just normal. That's just what we all do, right? I mean, if you can't afford something, you don't do it this year. You might wait till next year, or you might wait. And we used to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. We've we stopped for a while because we thought this is not this is penny wise and pound foolish. Mm -hmm. But then there are some things that you know could we could we wait on? Could we put it off? It's like this Rock Harbor that's mm -hmm. eight hundred thousand dollars. You know, do we need to spend it now? Could we put it towards something else? It's already, you know appropriated mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. so uh, again I think it's just a really slow continuous continuous discussion right uh, community discussion and mm -hmm. and regional discussion and because we're all in the same boat I mean East Ham has more infrastructure costs but those will be coming down you know and of course we could add more but yeah. water will be coming down and that was a huge huge $130 million borrowing at 2.4% interest for 6,000 households mm -hmm. is a lot of money. That is what got our tax rate to where it is mm -hmm. right now, not all the other little things that we've done. Fred? Uh, 
can I shift the conversation? Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to no, go on right. and on. So uh, when Patty and I sat with uh, Richie, told us how <clears throat> the tax rate is set and how you know new growth and all that. So you, you, how, you, much you, uh, Fred, how much you, statutorily uh, do we have to follow that that formula? For the new growth? No, Under for the, the whole setting of the process. I mean, 100 percent. Yeah, it's just the law. We just have to follow the law. It's crazy. I mean, are we going to be flush with cash because we, we, you know, Fred, m mass municipal finance is pretty crazy. It's it's like the most structured thing you've ever seen. Yeah. And you know, most of the time, I have to be honest with you, what Rich and I do, and thank God I have him and he has me because I'm not here <laughs> to But most of the time, we're trying to figure out how to go around the big boulder in our way, you know, and, and <laughs> it, it's just a matter of, okay, so this is a problem. The law is creating a problem. How do we do this? Because we can't give people tax relief because they don't allow us to do that. Um, but they have opened up some new categories and we'll be talking to the select board about that in October. We have a new affordable housing exemption we can mm -hmm. get. Um, but again, that costs us money because we have to fund it somehow. But, but is this new tax rate going to cause us to have an excess of cash. How? Are you saying that by, by, by uh, using the new tax rate of $7.71? Versus to bring in more revenue, shouldn't it? No. No, it doesn't work that way. Because well, I mean, I <laughs> the, the values the are lower, going up, right, so right. they're taxing. Yeah. If you were having a huge excess, you'd decrease the rate. You have the power to right. decrease the rate. Right. So you have to use the formula, but right, then the right, seven. And you know, Dennis does something psychological every year. They spend, they go to town meeting and they spend all the money that they would normally spend. And then the last article on town meeting is giving back $25,000 to reduce the tax rate. It's the best article. Everyone loves voting on this article. It is absolutely <laughs> useless. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah, who knows what the you know, but but they will never eliminate it. But it's just like the, that's the thing you have to think about is like, okay, if you're saving money over here, like tax breaks aren't tax breaks. Mm -hmm. We have to pay for them oh, oh, in the budget somehow. You know, I, I really appreciate the fact that you guys have looked at the unintended consequences. Because if we, you know, I'll age myself a little bit, we go back to proposition two and a half. Yes. Oh. I was a school teacher and my classroom went from 22 kids to 38 and I lost all my specialists. So music and art and LD, learning disabilities. And then the following year, those of us who were untenured were pink slipped and because there weren't enough positions. And I think the education where Massachusetts was way up here in the top, it tumbled. It was an unintended consequence and the wealthier towns were able to roll it back and it didn't always happen. So Right, and as I, Rich says, the prop two and a half is is gives us a path to limit things and then ask for what we think we need over and above that. It gives you a path to do that. That's an unusual well, sound for <laughs> um, So it's not I like so. we shouldn't be asking for overrides. It's not like it's a bad thing. It's a necessary thing, right? So, who is this doggy? Very excited. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a dog tag. We'll, 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 we'll square it. We'll square the dog in. And I think the DOA needs at six. Yeah, Jackie, I, I've lived in Connecticut. I've lived in New York State. Yeah. And now Massachusetts. I have never seen such a complex state. Yep. It, it is incredible. Yep. And I can't figure out why it is this way. I think it grew over time. It's like um, I've worked for, and so has rich bureaucracies, like not town government. Town government is a certain level of bureaucracy, but it's right. nothing like, you know, where we can go when people really think about it. And when you work for the state, if something bad happens, 
immediately someone comes up with a policy, a regulation, a decision a, a to guideline. prevent that bad thing from happening again. Right. And they just kind of pile up. And then you end up with this. So every once in a while, a brave governor will look at it like they did during COVID. They looked at it and they said, oh, we could get rid of this, this, and this, and this. And it might make things a little easier for a minute, you know? Um, and they'll they'll remove some of them, but it it's literally an overreaction to a problem. And this is why you know I really try and main uh, control my own anxiety mm -hmm. and really just think about everything very clearly. And when I can't do it, Rich can, and when Rich can't do it, I can. And that's why we work well together because it's like you know. It, it's just, you cannot overreact to the problem or you just, it adds up, the problem just adds up. Massachusetts is very good at making easy things hard. Yes. <laughs> but yet, <laughs> it, it, and it's yet true. I it's have always to say. a new slogan. guideline. Uh, one plan. person will we do one me. thing in and my, you get a new guideline. <laughs> in my free time, it relaxes me to go on Zillow and search for housing everywhere. I mean, I have like 26 searches going on. And I can tell you that there is no, like if you, Vermont, the property taxes in Vermont are horrendous, horrendous. New York, Connecticut, all those places, much higher than Massachusetts, or indefinitely much higher than the Cape. But part of it is because we haven't done the infrastructure that we were supposed to do. And so we are catching up. Um, we'll never be, you know, mm. Chelsea, but we're catching up. Mm -hmm. Well, it'd be nice to have some more commercial activity in town that would re reduce. But you don't the, have the, less commercial activity. What you have is residential building is moving oh, faster than commercial, commercial activity, value. and commercial activity can't move because we don't have oh, the do, septic. Oh, I have wastewater. So I agree. I agree. it's amazing that we have some new restaurants in town in the past two years. It's been really great, right? Because before then, we couldn't attract any new restaurants. So yeah, I yeah. disagree. I don't think we have less commercial. I think we actually have more and better. The percentage is less. It's the percentage. Because the housing value yeah, has gone up so much. Right? Everyone wants a house, and not everyone wants a single, single family business. house. Yeah, single family house exactly. with a white you need picket more fence. Multi I know a way we That'll can help the problem. Well, you know, there's also the, um, it's, it's a tiny fix, but habitat, having habitat builds in various places, you've got to find property for you it. You need the land. You need the land, exactly. But you can have it be a multifamily dwelling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's, I have a way we, <coughs> we can give some relief to uh, people who need it, which is the uh, exemption for CPA tax mm. for low income and low and, low and moderate income seniors. And I don't know what, I sent it something around to Rich and okay. Jerry earlier. Uh, this week, what kind of, um, you know, stress there, whatever cost that would be to the, to the town staff, but it's, but it's allowable. Yeah. Under under the CPA. So law. it would reduce it altogether, like to Take zero. Take away three percent. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. so that right would be helpful. Top. It helps, yeah. and it's eligible, available to low income people, town wide and low and moderate, which is up to 100% of AMI seniors. Brewster, so, Brewster has put it in place, and last year, I have the, all the, the, uh, the uh, verbiage. It was in their warrant article. Oh, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so that, so basically, that wouldn't necessarily, we would lose CPA f revenue. A little bit. But we wouldn't, it wouldn't cost us money, per well, se. We would lose CPA people revenue. People would have to come in, I guess, and verify that they're low yeah, income. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So but, that but, might... Cost, There's a process that they'd have to prove that they. Know what the cost of that yeah, would be. Yeah, yeah. But, but that wouldn't be huge. Be much. Yeah, it would be once a year, once so, a year, maybe twice a year. I don't know. We could do it. And it, that's targeted. I think that's a slam dunk. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, um, Dan Koppelman and I from the Community Preservation Committee met with Rich to talk about it. Okay, okay good. And good. I have all the all the verbiage uh, that you, Brewster used uh, to uh, um, put it in place. And that would, you know, that's a good, that's a good one. And, yeah. you know, if you have enough of the little ones, it does add up. It's just, we need, the state is trying to give us more tools. Mm. Um, 
it's kind of intermittent, but they, they do try, and they have in the past couple of years really tried to do more exemptions for us, mm -hmm. for towns to adopt or not adopt, mm -hmm. which helps. The interesting um, thing about something like the CPA that you're, that you're talking about, if that's a percentage, so that would change, the benefit could change year to year for those who get yeah. 3% of a certain Certainly. value changes right. if your home goes up, right? Right. right. So that's Is an interesting concept. Jackie, is there anything that prohibits us from waiving fees, like the transfer station, like the beach stickers? There is nothing that prevents us from waiving a local fee. We can't waive tax, but no, we I, can waive I, fee. I understand, but the transfer station, I don't know, whatever it is, a hundred and whatever dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. if, but you know, if you look at your revenue, it's a huge piece of it, it pays for the transfer station yeah, but operation. I don't think that's coming from me going there once a week. I think that's from the we're wallet. accepting people from out of town, right? The town no, I think it's all those hundred and twenty dollars is okay. yeah. Right. I'm curious. Those hundred and twenty dollars is add up because that's how we figure out what okay. that rate is. And unfortunately, we have to pay to have all of those all the trash moved. It's not something we can do. Right. Trash is getting cheaper. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> people, I think the issue is, like, if you want to make it cheaper, then you move to the pay, pay per throw because right. then, like, a, we're assuming that a single 64-year-old is not going to use as much trash as a family of four or two working adults living in the household, right? So, you know, you'd, you'd pay less. Yeah, we had that where I used to live, yeah. and everybody screams and yells initially, and then they go, wait, I'm saving money. Right, so it's hard to, you know, it's hard to judge. Is Some Brewster pay, pay for, uh, Brewster Orleans, I, I, I think somebody, somebody. Wellfleet moved to it. Pay, um, pay, pay, pay yeah, for a bag uh, or something? I think Brewster is. Yeah, yeah. Brewster is. Orleans, yeah. Orleans does it too. I'm sorry, Jerry? Orleans does it as well. Uh, yeah. And you just have to, you have to buy the bags. Yeah, right. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, the cost gets spread out. <laughs> you don't have to go buy that $120 sticker, but then you have to buy the bags and you have to, yeah. Hopefully you recycle more, but then we pay to CMS do that. CMS number yeah. is the number you got to go after. Yeah. That's, that's the big killer. Yeah. Which one? CMS. CMS. What yeah. we get to get rid of it the place we bring our trash and God knows where the poor trash ends up. Some some poor trash town somewhere in upstate New York or something. Mm. And that contract's up for renegotiation. Yes. Like this year, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. 2020, 2026? Fuel costs are coming down though. A little, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interest rates are coming down a little. Well, somebody that was a long me. diversion. Okay. Well, was. Somebody called me from the recycling committee on the numbers that I put together years ago. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing with them. Hmm. Probably rethinking it again. Hmm. Well, I think a recycling committee is thinking about uh, asking for the ability to have people purchase um, uh, booklets uh, so that they can give their renters the ability to go to the transfer station yeah. to recycle. Uh, uh, that's one of the things they're thinking of. Interesting. Okay. Neil, Neil never would let us. No, because it, it just, unless we put the recycling outside, how would you know if someone's just doing That's recycling right. or they're mm -hmm. dumping trash? Right. Doing something else. Yeah. Once you're in, you're in. <laughs> Staff. That would cost money. Right. So that's what <laughs> anytime we with each the bag, bag. This is what I always tell the select board. Anytime <laughs> you free, set right? a new regulation, then we have to Patty, enforce the regulation. There's <laughs> wine left in the bottle. How many bags do you have in your trunk? Open it up. Yeah. Yeah. When you add a regulation, you're going to take it. <laughs> Another guideline. <laughs> Get out of the car and you take out your bag. So oh my God, can you And laugh? spread them out on the ground. <laughs> okay, so we're. Um, can't do anything. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss with Rich the we community fund and we'll discuss um, the community preservation committee. As I said, I've already met with Rich, uh, Dan That's and good. I met on the subject matter uh, a while back. So we'll, we'll continue to work on it. And thank you everybody for listening to my spiel. Um, 
No, I do agree with you. That's a big tax increase, and mm -hmm. you know what the median the, the median it? income is in in East Ham. No, thirty nine thousand dollars. But people could have millions in the bank. Right. <laughs> Uh, um, <laughs> I apologize for taking us on that little diversionary whatever. I'm sorry? I apologize for the diversion with the, the questions about. No, you didn't. Oh, I no. think it's. We all, we this is what we're we here want for you to think about these things. That's what we're here right. for, to yeah. talk about things. You know, I compare it to the budget, too. It's the budget book. It was projected mm -hmm. to go up to 733, right, instead right. of the 771. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But about a $500 increase versus the. Mm -hmm. 676. Town yeah, meeting should be fun. Yes, yeah, it's going to be 733 with 771. In inflationary situation we're in seems I'm not I don't think $600 is no, it was budgeted to 530. So it's only a yeah. little more than what we had in the budget for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, just and we just don't want. Low. No one wants them to really go up because yeah. everything's going up, everything and I think that's up. what's frightening right. is mm -hmm. everything is right. going up, and especially with the past right. few years' inflation, I think it really scared people that you, you're just paying ridiculous the cost, the, the amounts cost all of, of a sudden. <laughs> the cost of food is. I know. Yeah. Right. But you know what else is going up is, um, you know, you, the landscaper comes to your house. W wait, wages oh. are going up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So wages. actually, working young people I don't know if they're doing fine but they're I think they can keep up with market supply and demand market forces the retired people have a different oh come on uh, Peter you can get a part-time job uh, <laughs> I, I you can work in the cafeteria you need to keep that recycling over the years <laughs> but uh, I don't know I think start a taxi service going for back and forth to Boston <laughs> will take care of a lot of it it's true Okay, um, we, we're down to item eight on the agenda, and I don't know whether you have any other. I am not talking anymore. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I refuse. Uh, I'm just going to ask about Beach Respectfully. Plum, Beach Plum, and Massasoit. Anything nope, you have there? to wait till October seventh. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to wait till October seventh oh. when we're giving an update to the select board. Oh, oh okay, okay, October seventh. All righty. Oh, I can't tell you stuff I haven't told them yet. Right. Oh, that's right. Jerry, oh, Jerry closure is. Through. <laughs> we're in a public meeting. Jerry will hurt, hurt his feelings. Well, they, you know, they. I know they're important. <laughs> okay. So, um, oh, you know, I, I actually I do have one thing that was brought to my attention before I asked for adjournment. Um, a, a year or so ago, I attended an RTA Regional Transit Authority meeting at the library. And one of the issues uh, that came up was the two bus shelters that uh, I asked about. They said they were going to be building two bus shelters, one at the Superette and one up towards the Willys area. And I asked them if they had the money to pay for them, and they said yes. yes. And it's now a year no and a half. No one's ever Win asked. That's what they said to the newspaper. No one's asked us. Win winter is coming, and we asked them. And they said sure. And, and, and you haven't heard anything? No. But we own Town Center Plaza, so that's an easy one. The Superette, they have to actually talk to the property yeah, owners. Yeah, I, I understand the, there's a land. So I don't understand why we don't have one at the Super, I mean, at the Town Center Plaza, and I will follow up on that okay. for the 90th time. But okay. I, yeah, I, they I, seemed very shocked that we hadn't asked. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, that's it for me. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. Roy, do I have a second? Second. Patty? All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Nine zero. It, it, it is 620. I have 620. Nine zero.